Welcome to MTN Outdoors. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of MTN Outdoors. I'm Geneva Zoltek, your host this week, filling in for Andy Curtis. Now, for our first story, we're going to talk about an iconic species that's making a comeback in the region thanks to tribes across the state. MTN's Jackie Coffin introduces us to the northern Cheyenne bison and the man on a mission to save them. On this 15,000 acre pasture southwest of Ashland, you'll find a herd of about 300 bison. They're a mixture of animals that have been here for 40 years, as well as a recent donation from St. LeBray. Determining the genetics of these animals is just one of the goals of the new bison management program. Without having a good healthy herd here, how could we call ourselves uh, good human beings, especially Native Americans, you know? This time last year, Brandon Small was doing something very different. I was an uh, employee for the, the coal mine and coal strip. Um, I, I worked there for 11 years. Yeah, see, we only have about five inches of water in there. And this herd of nearly 300 bison that have roamed northern Cheyenne lands since the 1970s looked different, too. Gone unmanaged and treated poorly malnourished, uh, no water. It hurt uh, to see that happen. She's an older cow. She's probably, I guess, close to 20. On his days off from the mine, Small started studying the animals and researching bison management, looking at the best fencing options and pasture to give the herd structure, leading him to a leap of faith. I, I think, to me, that's why I wrote the proposal, is because they, they should be honored and better taken care of than what they had been. And um, th I, I just... I couldn't sit down anymore. I had to do something, you know. Small drafted a multi-year bison management plan and submitted it to the Northern Cheyenne Tribal Council in January 2023. The tribe considered and accepted hiring Small on as the first Northern Cheyenne bison manager in decades. Giving them the best water we can, giving them the best forage we can, giving them the most, the maximum amount of space we can to do what they do and just be buffalo. Tribes own and manage bison on all seven of Montana's reservations. Working in here and getting this water developed and working on the fence and working with it out here every day. Small's crew is working on a corral to round up the bison, count them and get an idea of their genetics. Due to years of inbreeding and the limitations of the pasture, the herd will be scaled down through hunting and then regrown. Hopefully within five years we'll, we'll be able to be at least 300 head, maybe 400 head. Bringing Small's goals for the herd closer. I hope we can uh, continue to use them for, for years to come, for future generations. Near Ashland, Jackie Coffin, MTN News. Here in the heart of Crow Country, in the Bighorn Mountains, lies the sacred place, a buffalo pasture where the Crow people have hunted for decades. It was here where Crow youth had the chance to learn a little bit more about their own culture. It was a trek on rocky roads through dozens of misty miles. But several Crow kids made that journey to get here. This area we take it significantly a uh, sacred place. We're in the uh, buffalo pasture on a Crow Indian Reservation in the Bighorn Mountains. Uh, we call this area Bazohawa, our mountains. Noel Tulugan says the Crow people are one of the last tribes that still have buffalo on their homeland. The herd was established in the 1940s. The reason why we're here is so the youth don't forget who they are and where they come from and a lot of the students have never been here. These kids are part of a youth organization through Little Bighorn College's extension program meant to keep Crow culture alive. Oh yeah, over there. I feel like I'm a little bit closer to um, what the old, old timers did. 17 year old Nate Goodluck's grandfather taught him how to hunt at age five. He shot two bison in the past and was hoping to get his third one Sunday. Once you like walk up to them and see their body, it kind of gives you uh, like a reverence almost because of how much energy and how much life has just came out of that, you know, came out of that, that being. Low visibility kept the buffalo at bay, so the hunt had to be called off, which meant 17-year-old Vanessa Afraid of Bear didn't have to get her hands dirty. As Absaligo, like women, we aren't really supposed to be shooting the guns or actually taking the life but we do play a big part in like processing the meat and taking out all the guts. But she feels lucky that she even got to step foot in the sacred land. Crows, we survived a lot of things and that 
we are very resilient and we are able to come back and practice the ways of our ancestors. For two leggings, it's come full circle, but his role is now one of teacher. As a child, I always came here a lot with my grandfather, so I feel it's important. And if I, I don't know, but sometimes I feel like if I don't do it, who's going to do it? In Crow Agency, Alina Howder, MTN News. A near deadly attack happened here at Over the Hill Equine Rescue just two weeks ago. One of the 23 horses was attacked by a mountain lion. And fortunately, they're recovering. But it's a jarring incident for the owner. I was shocked. I was like, what happened to you? When Sarah Shipman's dog started barking loudly during a phone call a few weeks ago, she didn't think anything of it. Never even thought that it had to do with the horses. But once the call was over and Shipman walked outside, she discovered her worst nightmare. The one horse was frantic and was pacing and sweating. And I put him away and then I found my other mare down here at the bottom of the driveway um, completely just cut up and injured. One of her horses had been attacked by a mountain lion, something Shipman says she's never seen before. So she just had claw marks all the way down and some bite marks and then a two inch puncture on her spine. It was shocking. And then after that, I kind of went into panic mode. To make matters worse, Char, the horse that was injured, means more to Shipman than the others. She's one that we rescued 10 years ago, brought her back to health and, and we've kept her. And so to find her, I mean, it was, it was heartbreaking. Shipman says Fish, Wildlife, and parks scouted the property in the days that followed, but so far the mountain lion hasn't returned. So we're going to start setting up trail cramps on our perimeter fence just so we can kind of monitor and see what wildlife is around so that way we know. As for Char, the horse is recovering and despite a few battle wounds will be okay, but Shipman is worried it could happen again, possibly to another horse. We don't want to bring him here for safety and then have them get you know, traumatized. It could have been much, much worse. She probably could have easily been killed. In Billings, Charlie Kleps, MTN News. You're looking at a familiar routine for boaters driving through Montana. When the boat pulls up, um, we are actually starting to enter data from the time that they come into the parking lot. At Helena's stop off Highway 12, watercraft are inspected for evidence of aquatic invasive species. Hitchhiking, coaga, and zebra mussels are the biggest concern. Um, we look at anchors, live wells, the inside of the boat, the outside of the boat. This station is part of a network that spans across the state. It's the first line of defense against the spread of costly and ecosystem altering pests. When a boat has muscles on it, it requires a little bit more. So we get off what we can, but then that boat goes into a, a lockdown phase. It's been a great season. Uh, inspected over 88,000 boats this year. That's um, looking for aquatic invasive species. This year, 45 muscle fouled boats were intercepted in Montana. Last year, 53, and in 2021, a record 61. During COVID, we saw a lot of staycationers that just had nothing else to do, so they got out in the water um, because it was lockdown time, right? With the uptick in recreation, 2021 saw a spike of nearly 180,000 boat inspections. So where are these mussels coming from, and what's the big deal? Some of them from the southwest, like Lake Havasu, Lake Mead. Um, and what we see in the Great Lakes in particular is a lot of people are going there to purchase boats. Um, in a couple days, it's here ready to launch with live mussels and, and could impact all our waters. Originally stemming from Europe, coaga and zebra mussels were introduced to the U.S. in the 1980s and have since infested major bodies of water, mainly towards the East Coast. Invasive mussels represent a serious threat to ecological health. They smother surfaces, taking away important real estate for native shells. Basically, any hard surface they will stick to and start piling up on top of each other. So. Well, the inspection network, it runs in some capacity through late October. And it's, of course, an important step in keeping Montana's waters clean and pristine. But it's not the full picture for prevention. For that, we have to take a much closer look. Geneva Zoltek, MTN News. This guy right. After the break, we've got an inside look at a lab in Helena that monitors Montana water samples for creatures too small for human detection. We now return to MTN Outdoors. 
Welcome back everybody to MTN Outdoors. Now, Montana is home to very large animals like the mountain lion and the bison, but we are also home to really small animals in the ecosystem. And I'm gonna take you to a Montana lab that looks for aquatic invasive species through a microscope. A uh, 63 micron net is drawn through the water column, usually about 100 meters. Um, and then that's all condensed into an end piece. The AIS lab technicians in Helena keep a watchful eye on Montana's waters. This guy right here, right next to the ostracod, is a dinoflagellate. I'd say average 15 samples. Um, 20 is a good day. That's around 4,000 samples of water processed per year. The tiny mussel larvae are relatively easy to identify on this microscope using cross-polarized light. Luckily, the calcium carbonate in their shell glows. Most things in the water column don't have much calcium in them. And on top of veligers, which is what the larval state of mussels is called, on top of them glowing, they glow in a very certain pattern called a Maltese cross. Um, and nothing else really shows that pattern. So it makes it a very easy way to find a needle in a haystack. But no needle or muscle has been identified in any Montana water body for quite some time. I've never seen one in a sample from Montana. And that's good news. After suspected mussel spawn were identified in the Canyon Ferry outside Helena and Tiber Reservoir outside Chinook in 2016. Well, fast forward to today, and it's been over five years clear of any more muscle evidence found in any Montana waterway. So despite the lack of evidence, Idaho finding uh, aquatic invasive species earlier in September shows that the species very much still poses a risk to the West. That's why it's so important to clean drain and dry those boats. Reporting from Canyon Ferry, Geneva Zoltek, MTN News. While it might not seem it yet, frigid temperatures and snow will soon be here. I spoke with GardenWorks to find out how you can help protect your property from the cold. Things start slowing down this time of year with the reduced sunlight. The leaves start changing. The plants have want to get, they want to get ready for winter. They don't want to continue growing year round. So they want to take a, re, you know, a little rest for the winter. So you want to encourage that resting period and you know, make sure they have everything they need to, to rest. Getting your yard, gardens, sprinkler systems, and even water features prepared can not only benefit you and your pocketbook, but also the plants that inhabit your yard. Heal says that as we approach fall and winter, you want to help the plants slow down their growth process. This means not doing any major pruning on trees or most plants, as this typically encourages growth. Additionally, you want to cut back on water and not use fertilizer on your trees or most plants this time of year. You can begin to use less water on your lawn as well, says Heal, and you want to make sure to clear your sprinkler system of water before the first big freeze hits. You also want to make sure to disconnect your hose from the faucet. GardenWorks also has a water feature with some fish on their property. During the winter, they put a small heater and aerator in the water in order to help keep the koi alive. As for vegetable gardens, most produce should be harvested now, such as squash and beans. You can wait to pick your pumpkins for now, giving them time to mature. Heal says that GardenWorks leaves up their ornamental gardens with such plants as flowers, perennials, and grasses. We like to leave them up for the winter so you have something to look at during the winter and do some more severe pruning in the, in the spring. Heal says that you want to take these steps before it begins to freeze. Whenever that happens, which could happen any day now. Last fall was a good indication. We had a really severe couple cold days and it got nice again. So that it fools plants and fools people because they think it's going to be nice again, but it can turn in an instant. Reporting in Helena, Tom Buchanan, MTN News. These bags are filled with concentrates of rare earth elements that were extracted from the toxic water of Butte's Berkeley pit. Now these elements could be used for important national defense projects and, believe it or not, green energy projects. 
you need what's in these bags if you're going to go green. So once again, here in Butte, Montana, we're producing green energy right here. Montana Resources has partnered with the Department of Defense, Montana Tech, and West Virginia University in a feasibility study to extract rare earth elements from the pit. This is part of a national effort to extract and process these elements domestically since China has become the world leader in producing rare earth elements. From a DOD standpoint, uh, you know, we have a, a, a near pure adversary in China. You see it in the news all the time. We cannot be dependent on a potential adversary. For years, Montana Resources has been trading pit water from its Horseshoe Bend processing plant to remove heavy metals from this water. We've got the, the facility that's, that we need. We have the need to treat the water and a, a whole bunch of win-wins are coming together uh, and, and it's just the potential uh, that this brings is just huge. This project involves taking pit water from the processing plant, storing it in these bags, so eventually some of the water will evaporate away, leaving a sludge of material containing the rare earth elements. The sludge will then be taken to West Virginia to process it further into a concentrate of rare earth elements. These elements would be used in defense systems such as helicopters and materials to produce renewable energy sources like electric cars and wind turbines. If the study is successful, a potential processing plant could be set up at Montana Resources to begin extracting these elements full-time. Uh, I think this is an amazing project you know with Montana resources in here utilizing the Berkeley pit as, as, as a source of material is, is tr a tremendous idea that needs to continue to move forward. In Butte, John Amy, MTN News. Players from across the USA and even Canada have come to Butte this weekend to play the ancient sport of hurling. Oh, hurling is uh, an ancient Irish sport, it's like 3,000 years old, uh, massive heritage and folklore to it, so we're just keeping the dream alive here. Yes, 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 come on, yes, come on. Originally from Northern Ireland, Jimmy is one of 10 players who made the trip down from Canada to attend the Butte Hurling Tournament that welcomed 44 hurlers for their third annual games. It is a very fast, some say brutal, game on grass. It's the fastest game on grass. Ryan Mulcahy of Butte's Wolf Towns Hurling Club says the sport originated as a way to train warriors and it's played with a stick and a ball with the goal to get the ball into the net or over the uprights to score points. But perhaps the most important element of the sport is its ties to Irish culture. We brag every year on the 17th that we are the most Irish city in Montana. For us not to embrace and learn about this sport, it's a little, a little sad if we don't. Most of the players on the field this past weekend were U.S. athletes, and some have no ties to Ireland. But Steve Power, a referee from Arizona, who is originally from Southeast Ireland, says tournaments like this make him feel closer to home. It's really like the backbone of Ireland. I mean, it's, it's you know, the heart and soul of Ireland is hurling. You know? So you're so far away from Ireland, but, but right here you're, you're still... Absolutely. I mean, I'm, uh, what, three and a half thousand miles away from Ireland, but I'm only a couple of feet away from hurling. I mean, it's amazing. It's, it really is the fun sport in the world. Um, I grew up playing basketball, but <clears throat> when I started playing hurling, it just changed everything. So if you're running, you can hope in Butte, Megan Thompson, MTN News. Coming up next, Montana is seeing a surge in popularity for another alternative livestock option to cattle, goats. And I'm not kidding. More after the break. We now return to MTN Outdoors. Welcome back to MTN Outdoors. Now, when you think of Montana agriculture, I bet you think 
of cattle. And around here, cows are more numerous than people, but there's another farm animal that might be giving the cow a run for its money. MTN's Jane McDonald has this story on the Goat Montana Project. Now, the last time we were here at Goat Montana, it was kidding season. Now, it's kind of kitten season, but we're still talking all about goats, specifically just how much interest there's been in the past 18 months for Goat Montana. Jane, it's really exciting. The response that we've gotten from Montana producers and their interest in goats in Montana has just really exceeded our expectations. It started as an idea for Shilea Wingard, create a network for goat producers to share information. Now it's become a fully realized organization with over 500 followers and members traveling around the country for conferences. With our background with MSU Extension, uh, we found that there wasn't a lot of resources available to help producers get into this. The United States doesn't produce enough goat meat. Goat is among the top four most widely consumed meats in the world. There's a need and a demand. And as a bonus, goats are much smaller than other livestock, so you don't need a lot of acreage to have a meaningful production. And Shailia says that it's not just newcomers on the agriculture scene investing in goats, it's also longtime ranchers. In the past when the beef cattle market was kind of down, the drought was hitting, they had to liquidate their herds. They were looking at other options for diversification and the goat market has kind of been real steady incline. Um, and then the other place that it's come from is people with small acreages trying to get started and trying to figure out what to do with their land and what's something, you know, that they can raise that works well with a small acreage. Goat Montana has plenty of information and resources, so we'll be sure to link those in our website, as well as upcoming events. In Ennis, Jane McDonald, MTN News. Well, that does it for this week's MTN Outdoors. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, let's take a look at that brag board.